Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the legacy of Paul Bocuse, one of a series of culinary luminaries. We were just joking, actually, one of my uh, colleagues also before this, about the fact that you might not want to be honored in this series because it requires that you be dead. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, we don't plan it that way, but that's the way it certainly comes up. I am B. Banyu. I'm chair of the Food Studies program here at the New School. First, I wanted to go through a little bit of the logistics. Many of you are um, uh, repeaters, uh, and you will know this, uh, but we are, in fact, videotaping this, uh, and the videotape will be available on the New School uh, YouTube series uh, afterwards, usually about a week or, th or two after. But when we have the Q&A at the end, I'm sure we'll have some time uh, for that, um, I would ask you to actually uh, go to the microphones so that we can hear your question as well as the answers um, to the questions. Uh, we may not have uh, people that can distribute them. I'll be here and I'll be distributing one of them, but the other one might be stationary. So we'll work this out logistically as we go along. I did want to tell you about a couple of other things that are going on um, uh, actually this summer. We have two of our um, massive online uh, courses running on canvas.net. Um, currently, the Innovators of American Cuisine has already started, but enrollment, I gather, continues until um, June 15th. It's a five-week series based on our Culinary Luminaries program, and it includes um, uh, a week on Julia Childs, a week on James Beard, on Edna Lewis, and the like. So some of our past programs. Uh, and starting on June 18th, we have another series, a MOOC, on canvas.net, Writing American Food, featuring lectures on Judith Jones, Craig Claiborne, MFK Fisher, Clementine Paddlefoot, and Michael um, Batterberry. So um, those are free for anybody who is interested in uh, going there. You just go to canvas.net uh, and you can sign on. Now, this is a commercial, obviously, for the Food Studies program. That's why um, there's always someone here to tell you a little bit about us. We offer a BA, a BS, and an AAS in Food Studies here at the New School. Um, we have three major areas of concentration, culture, media, and communication, which is our biggest hit, and health and the environment and policy and politics. We also, through Open Campus, which is a different portal for entering our classes um, for continuing education students, we offer a series of classes there as well. For instance, we have American Culinary History, Contemporary Food Controversies, and Zero Waste Food, all of them taught, by the way, by my friend Andy Smith. Um, and the last one, Zero Food Waste, is just a five-week session, as a matter of fact. So anybody interested in taking those classes in fall 2018 just needs to go into Open Campus. That's the portal that you go into if you're not a degree-seeking student. Otherwise, if you want to take a degree, just talk to me. We're good. Um, we also have two others not taught by Andy, um, and that's Kids and Food and Food and Emerging Technologies, also through Open Campus. So without further ado, I would like to first thank the James Beard Foundation um, for helping sponsor this event and uh, introduce um, the person who will moderate the discussion for tonight, Mr. Andrew Smith. Thank you, B. And I, too, want to welcome all of you here. This is the 12th Culinary Luminary Program we have had since 2008. And the good news is it is filmed. And so, <coughs> consequently, the words of wisdom that our panel tonight uh, will be preserved forever on YouTube. So uh, we know now, does that make them frightened? <laughs> uh, and as B also mentioned, we've used the Culinary Luminaries programs in our mass open online classes. They are free. If you haven't had one, anyone can take it. You can sign up for them. And I strongly encourage, if anybody is interested in taking a look at the other programs, to at least take a look at the massive open online classes, which are currently underway. Um, 
The uh, second thing is a number of people who I talked with in preparation for this program said that they had uh, they knew Paul Bocuse or had met him and had interaction with him. Do I can I see the hands of those of you who fall into that category? Uh, several some people asked that they could say something, um, and if you wish to say something after the panel has said briefly about your interaction with Paul Bocuse, I would appreciate that, and I'm sure the audience would as well. So I will give you that option a little later. We have four fantastic panelists. Uh, they need no introduction. Uh, they need no introduction because everybody knows exactly who they are and because we've handed out their bios. Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm delighted uh, that they are here uh, and um, I'm delighted that the topics that they have chosen are ones that are, are interesting to me and I hope will be interesting to you as well. Our fast, uh, first speaker will be Anne McBride. Anne is the co-author of six books, um, and she is the program director for Worlds of Flavor International Conference and Festival at the Culinary Institute of America and the director of the Experimental Cuisine Collective at NYU. Um, Anne? Yes. Thank you, Andy. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be talking about Paul Bocuse in this setting because it's Andy has forced me to think about him in slightly different ways, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, as you might guess, I will be talking a little bit about Paul Bocuse and gender. I don't know why I would be the one taking this on on this panel, but um, I've decided that would be um, kind of the right framing. So um, th my research and my work pertains on the, the 21st century chef and this new generation of chef and chef and expertise, um, the, the, how chefs have developed their role as experts and the way they're perceived right now as experts. Um, and much of that, and the way I've always thought about it, is first because of Paul Bocuse, because he um, is who allowed chefs to become entrepreneurs. I'm sure my fellow panelists will touch on that a lot more, but he was the first one who said chefs should own their businesses, chefs should step out of the kitchen, chefs can do brand partnerships and make money in other ways than the kitchen. He would famously tell his cooks um, to, not, to always say that Paul Bocuse is in-house and never reveal where he was traveling. But in an interview I found um, when asked who cooks the food when you're traveling, he said the same people who do when I am in the house. And so that's very, you know, that was 30 years ago. That is still very much actual right now. And it's very important for chefs to have, for, for the chefs of today, to have had that um, permission in a way to become others and just anonymous um, laborers in the back of the kitchens. Um, so he has this very important legacy and um, th this very, this enormous presence that has liberated a lot of chefs. But at the same time, in thinking about it in the context of this panel, it's like I've never is this still okay in 2018 to be teaching that in culinary schools, to be saying, or elsewhere, to be talking about Paul Bocuse only in those ways, only in terms of this enormous liberation he's done for chefs and, and this stepping up of their role, um, when he's also said that he prefers women in his bed than in his kitchen, equally famously, right? And so is he the right mentor or the right person that a young chef should look up today when at the CIA, for example, as of last year, there are more female male student enrollees than male student enrollees. Is this the kind of person that you want to blankly put up as the one person to look up to, right? Um, so it's been really, really interesting to, to research a little bit beyond just the, the anecdotes and rumors I had heard. Um, he has not really mentored women. Um, this is someone who took over his own restaurant in 1956 and had many, many restaurants. His first woman executive chef was in 2013. 2013, <laughs> um, a young woman who lasted a year and then went on to open her own restaurant. Um, he was someone who obviously had a very strong sense of hierarchy in the kitchen, the brigade uh, system, and um, a young uh, Canadian pastry chef who went and spent time there was saying that um, her experience was absolutely amazing, even though that was in 2017 or 2015. She was not into classic things, and that's not what she wanted to do later, but she felt she really needed the foundations, and she couldn't pass up an opportunity to learn and study with Bocuse. Um, but she was saying the hierarchy is such there that the chef creates and the commie and the sous chefs execute only. And she was missing that creativity beyond just learning the practice of it. Um, so I also thought that was really interesting in terms of um, 
the fact that this this hierarchical system and sticking to it for for his entire life meant that there was no real room for a mentorship to be developed for women and to be to be um, Cre helping to create a new generation of women chefs in France. And that's a problem in the sense that there are not that many women chefs in France today. There are not that many in Italy. There are not that many in Spain or in Portugal. I mean, it, it's weirdly funny that in the US, only 18% of women uh, of restaurants are owned and operated by women. Um, and it's still actually pretty good compared to other countries. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of uh, work to remain that remains to be done. So for me, Bocuse is a luminary, there's a huge legacy there, but I really want to think of him as a historical figure, and I want to think of him in the past, and I don't want to think of him in the future, and I want to make sure that this is a nuance that is brought on whenever we talk about Paul Bocuse now, or for the rest of our lives, that there's always that little asterisk there, and that we don't put him up as the one mentor, or, or, or as this one person that should be looked up on when a 20-year-old will not identify with him, and should Students. So I'll stop there. Our second panelist is Ray Sokoloff. Um, we, has, he claims to have been born in Detroit in 1941. Uh, anybody else from Detroit in here? So we have fans already, Ray? <laughs> a few years later. Uh, he is the author of many books, including uh, the one I love, Steal the Menu, a memoir of 40 years in food. Um, and I want you to know, Ray and I uh, had a, uh, we, we met last night at another event at NYU, um, and Ray mentioned that he had published the first article on Paul Bocuse and Nouvelle Cuisine in the United States. And so we put it together and handed it out just so that you could see it. I wanted all of you to know that Betty Fussell claims to have interviewed Paul Bocuse before this, but I couldn't find any published version, so it doesn't matter, it's fake news. Uh-oh. Austin what? Off duty. Off duty, okay. Uh, we'll um, correct this in the final production of the <laughs> well, <laughs> Ray. Um, when was that book published? I don't want to get in a fight about priority. What I, <laughs> what I, what I can tell you is that in 1967, uh, when I was in the Newsweek Paris Bureau, my boss, Joel Blocker, um, was, uh, uh, had heard a lot about what was going on with chefs who had many of them trained in a restaurant in, uh, uh, in Vienne, uh, Fernand Point, and had opened their own restaurants and were now, at last, breaking the Escoffier mold. And he wanted to do a cover story for Newsweek about it, but he was ahead of his time, like the pre premature anti-fascists in, uh, in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, he, they, the editors in New York wouldn't let him do it, but I remembered that. Bocuse, I think then, still had only two stars. But uh, when, when I was able, finally, to go to France with some authority for the New York Times in 1972, um, my goal really was to go to Bocuse, and I made the reservation well in advance, risking the newspaper's budget by making a transatlantic phone call to reserve a space. And, <laughs> but of course, I didn't explain who I was. I, I think, I, I laugh at it now, I, I used a false name, and uh, not that he would have had any idea who I was, and uh, he had never, I, I can promise you, been written about in the US media as, as an important uh, chef. But on the train going down there, I, uh, on the seat next to me, someone had abandoned a copy of a regional edition of the um, news magazine L'Express, which had him on the cover. And I, I read that article and, um, it, it, and it prepared me for the fact that Joel had been writer than he knew and that uh, even uh, in France, these people were now big news and called Young Turks and Nouvelle Vague and so on. And so I was, pre in, I, I, I thought I had uh, been what um, a, a, a woman reporter at the Times uh, uh, taught me the phrase, the lucky reporter, because um, I had made all these plans on the, on, on the uh, assumption that Joel had, had been onto something, and now I saw that he really had been. Um, so I got there, and I was traveling with a, an American expat named Jack Nisberg, who spoke extremely fluent French with a Chicago accent. <laughs> and 
he, he had been everywhere and knew everything about France, and he could stop a rush hour, traf a, a rush hour crowd in the metro to pose for a picture. He was a, so we, we went there, we had this extraordinary meal. And when it was over, uh, Bocuse had left already, and he was actually in residence, and um, he, <laughs> or in the kitchen, and his uh, glacial wife uh, w uh, really froze when I explained to her that I would like to interview him while I was there and what for and so on. And um, this just wasn't done. Uh, the, um, I mean, my previous experience with the French gastronomic press was that they uh, uh, never paid for anything, always announced they were coming in advance. So um, I, I, uh, he, he met me, however. He picked me up with his van early in the morning, and we went on what I later came to see was a trip that he not only made to go to the market, um, but also uh, whenever there was a visiting fireman of consequence, he would take them along, and you would see how he was a hands-on chef who even bought fish in the morning in a van, and took you for a mid-morning snack with the woman who uh, it, it, I suspected, and it became entirely clear later, was his mistress. And uh, so, uh, the, I mean, the, the, uh, I, 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 I make no judgment here. The, the, so the, it the, was the, a traditional restaurant what, in it some was, ways. I mean, I, I think they were part of the Them Too movement then, because, <laughs> you know. <laughs> The the uh, the undeclared. Uh, <laughs> uh, OOC. Uh, so the, the uh, but the at any rate, finally he made lunch for me. You know, and it was um, if you think about it, a, a, a kind of extraordinary privilege uh, because I went in the kitchen. He took a, f uh, a fish had already uh, this uh, sea bass was two feet long, uh, and he rolled, rolled out dough and put a pastry crust on it and decorated it so that it looked like a fish. And I had no idea at the time that I would later come to think of the school of cooking that later, a year or two after my visit, was dubbed the Nouvelle Cuisine, um, uh, which itself was actually a historical echo of an earlier, I think, 17th century Nouvelle Cuisine that itself was re revolutionary anyway. Who? Whether he knew that or not, I, I certainly didn't. And the, um, at any rate, this fish within a fish, which uh, was served um, with a, a sauce choron, which was very witty also, because um, it was a Bernese sauce with tomato in it, and you could find it in, in, in uh, Escoffier, and maybe um, uh, everyone but me knew about that, but I, I mean, I'm, I, I looked it up, and so it was terribly classic, but what was not classic was the idea of serving that kind of, of, of sauce with, with an, a very elaborate fish, and it was a sauce that you did a la minute, essentially, you know, like a Bernays that required no, n not many hours of work at a, at a sauce pot, and so this was, we later saw was typical, the, the improvisational nature, the, the kind of studied informality of the Nouvelle Cuisine, and its, uh, its interest in, in, at least in the case of Alain Sandarin, who uh, was in the beginning a, a, a historical cook in his, in his first restaurant, uh, wanting to revive medieval recipes in a kind of slightly modernized way. And the, uh, all, of, all of the things that, that happened that day, I later saw, had a kind of important historical resonance. I, whether Bo the question in my mind has been ever since, what, did Bocuse, who was a very full personality, as I, I think is well, well known, um, it, it, whose restaurant came to look like a carnival event, um, in, the, in its later years, uh, who really was, I think, uh, the, uh, remiss in spending as much time in Japan as he did. Uh, but at any rate, the, the, this, this was a very serious person at, at age 46 in 1972, and um, he was completely unknown, and not only in the United States, but in England, no one, uh, no one had ever written written about him, and I have, at least as far as I've been able to determine. And the, um, I went the, f the following week 
Uh, the, uh, I arrived on Palm Sunday, was in a cab accident on the way in from the airport, um, and went, got on the train the next morning, and then came back to Paris, and Nisberg, who really knew what was going on, said, you know, you, if you like that, you really have to, have to go to, uh, to Michel Guérard, and we went to this horrible suburb, Anier, a, 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 a hotbed of uh, a de uh, decrepitude and crime, and uh, in, 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 in this corner, there w was um, a restaurant that was truly revolutionary. I mean, Bocuse was a great chef, but, but Gerard was a genius, and, <laughs> uh, in my view. And, and that restaurant on the Rue des Bas uh, was the fountainhead of so much that, that we take for granted today. But it was really like eating in a, in, a, in a suburban garage. The kitchen was really in a shack, and we ate outdoors um, in a, on a kind of patio. There were eight or nine tables, and these young men in, in long aprons. Anyway, to get back to Bocuse, what, um, what happened immediately afterwards in, in the course of the next year was that he, was, he became a worldwide celebrity. And um, th there, there ensued a period which I think continues today of, com of, of great misunderstanding about what he and, and the Troigro brothers and Gerard were really doing. And I think they are to some degree at fault because they never really explained themselves that uh, Gerard in fact contributed greatly by publishing a diet, what was a, supposed to be a diet cookbook, and that made everyone think that these, these uh, si grand but simplified recipes that the Nouvelle Cuisine uh, became famous for what were really the point of them was that they didn't have uh, they were low cal, and um, uh, the if you read Cuisine Minceur, which was a bestseller, you got that impression. Then it was I think you, you know dishonest. Later his great book came out, but Bocuse's book books were uh, especially the first one, which was you know at the height of his his early fame. Um, I looked at it and and I couldn't I couldn't see. The, a common thread in it. There were wonderful recipes again and again, and yes, they were uh, modern in a sense that they uh, di didn't have 16 garnishes, um, in, and they really did make a difference with Escoffier, but he never really, he was not, let's say that, that Bocuse was not an intellectual. And that's not a sin for a chef, of course, but it, the, when they were doing something that was, in fact, um, intellectually complex in the kitchen, um, the, it, it, it didn't help uh, in, in the way that, that they were interpreted and understood. Thank you. Our third panelist is Paul Friedman, is the, who is the Chester D. Tripp Professor of History at Yale University, is the author and editor of several books, including the one I love, Ten Restaurants That Changed America, which will soon be out in paperback. Thanks very much, Andy. So uh, I thought I'd start out with an article from 1969 uh, in the Travel and Lifestyle Magazine Holiday. Uh, they had asked the critics, uh, Henri Gault and Christian Mio, what was the best restaurant in the world? 1969 is an intriguing year because it's on the eve of the Nouvelle Cuisine movement, which Gault and Mio actually named <clears throat> and vigorously supported. So although they took for granted that the only really serious cuisine in the world was French, in 1969, they were in fact discontent with what they saw as its tired traditions. In this article, they begin by acknowledging their preconceptions at, uh, in favor of France, and their response is, tant pis. Uh, <laughs> they then proceed to eliminate most of the rest of the world. Uh, the Soviet Union and China obviously had completely uh, um, uh, destroyed their culinary traditions. Uh, the best Chinese food in the world, they claimed, was not in Hong Kong or Singapore, but in San Francisco at the Imperial Palace. <coughs> yeah, their judgment on the rest of the world is quite unreliable, <laughs> needless to say. The Middle East has nothing except for maybe Francophile Lebanon. 
Latin America and Eastern Europe are hopeless. They used uh, the expression gastronomically underprivileged. <laughs> Africa is a total loss except for Francophone Senegal and Morocco. Not really Morocco, Marrakesh. As for the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, its food is uh, pretentious and inauthentic and uh, indistinguishable, that is international. But uh, 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 they're having a dialogue. So Go asks, aren't there some good, even great restaurants in London, New York, and Montreal? And Millot responds, yes, but the chefs of all those places are French. So then Europe, they're a little happier, but still contemptuous about the food of Spain and Portugal, which is ordinary and heavy. They disagree about Italy. Go complains, I've never had a single exciting meal. Uh, so, um, yeah, Italian food. Uh, Go says, I don't have an exciting memory uh, of any meal I had in Italy. And um, uh, Mio disagrees. He says, uh, uh, oh, the scampi at Harry's Bar in, uh, in Venice. <laughs> and uh, uh, also Dodici Apostoli in Verona and a couple of others. They agree that Danish food is of good quality. Um, children like it. <laughs> but obviously, this is not a great cuisine. Belgium is full of honorable but not quite top restaurants. In Switzerland, they cook in the French manner adequately but without spark. <laughs> Still true today. <laughs> so uh, Swiss. then they turn, they turn to France, which, and they discuss 25 restaurants. I won't <laughs> go through this. But their final list is two. They can't decide between Trois Gros and uh, uh, Bocuse's restaurant. Trois Gros is regarded as more traditional, intimate, and familial, while Bocuse is praised as a master of grandeur and creativity. The dishes extolled by Go and Mio are light, playful, and original. Um, mussel soup with fresh saffron, partridge with cabbage, which actually uses the pressed partridge juice with the cabbage rather than the meat of the bird. Uh, but the real contrast they draw is personality, that the Trois Gros are careful craftsmen <clears throat> working purely for the sake of tradition, whereas Bocuse is working for fame. Trois Gros represent wisdom, and Bocuse represents glory. This is really situated in one particular moment, because within a year or two, Go and Mio would not only embrace the innovative, creative program of Nouvelle Cuisine, but they would, in fact, coin the term Nouvelle Cuisine and uh, issue its Ten Commandments. Remember these, thou shalt lighten thy menu, <laughs> thou shalt be inventive, and so forth. Similarly, the Tuagro brothers really were not defenders of some ancient tradition. Their Escalope de Saman à l'Ose is perhaps among the most famous Nouvelle Cuisine uh, dishes, salmon with uh, sorrel sauce. In 2018, actually, we mark the 50th anniversary of the near revolution of 1968 in France. So it's clear that the upheaval in France in 1968 had an indirect and unpredicted, but in retrospect already visible influence on the transformation of French cuisine. The Nouvelle Cuisine program shared with that of the revolutionary expectations of 1968 a disdain for what was regarded as a tired and sclerotic established order. It attempted to rejuvenate it and make it less hierarchical by freeing cuisine of its rules, its garnishes, uh, emphasizing inventiveness, however, Nouvelle Cuisine ennobled the chef and like many revolutions may be said to have substituted one dominant class for another. Even though ridiculed for its small portions and large plates at high price, uh, its outre combinations, its overuse of raspberry sauce, vanilla, and kiwi fruit, Nouvelle Cuisine's permanent contributions include some of the things we've been discussing already, a lighter aesthetic, emphasis on the quality of primary ingredients, the elaboration of salads, uh, maigret de canard, and stylish plating. Seems to me the most important legacy of Nouvelle Cuisine, however, is that the chef came to be conceived as an artist, 
not merely as a skilled master craftsman. And this is the significance of Paul Bocuse, it seems to me, more than any particular repertoire of dishes. Notoriously, he became a critic of Nouvelle Cuisine, uh, which he summarized to Michael Steinberger as, quote, nothing on the plate, everything on the check. Uh, and Steinberger <laughs> said, I suspect that I was not the first journalist uh, to receive this little piece of wisdom. That was a retrospective view. Steinberger interviewed him in, I think, 2007. Bocuse was not the first celebrity chef, uh, but he was the first global brand chef, I think. His innovations were not so much what was served in his restaurants, um, whose kitchens, as we've heard, it's fair to say, he did not very closely supervise, or at least not directly. The fact that we are here is testimony to his fame, his embodiment of the spirit of French cuisine, uh, in the first era in which French cuisine started to receive competition for its previously unquestioned hegemony over global high-end dining. His innovations are uh, uh, many, including the Bocuse d'Or, um, which is the father of Iron Chef, and the idea of competitions uh, among chefs. So, I don't think it's fair to uh, engage in comparisons of you know, Bocuse, like uh, frivolous chef, Alain Chapelle's serious chef, or uh, I think there's a lot of envy. Bocuse had an ebullient but immodest personality. But it's fair to say that the two major phenomena of the last 50 years in the world of food, or let's draw back and say among the major uh, facts of the last 50 years is the eclipse of French domination and the modern uh, rise of a modern media savvy business oriented celebrity chef. And Bocuse has a key role in both of these. Ironically, the decline of French hegemony is the result of the teachings and visibility of French ideas of food. Uh, this is particularly clear in the case of the United States from MFK Fitcher to Alice Waters, people who in France learned something that they then applied to um, uh, America or to the creation of a non-French cuisine. The bringing of locality, uh, terroir maybe is too strong a term, but certainly pleasure to an American setting. But it also influenced El Bouilly, which, like Chez Panisse, began as a French restaurant and then changed, obviously, into something else. 2018 is also a year in which the entire contemporary deified celebrities, including not the least chefs, is being secularized. Secularized meaning um, taken off the altars uh, and overturned by, among other things, and perhaps, well, certainly most importantly, the Me Too movement. Bocuse is hardly to blame for the bad behavior of American chefs, whose machismo until just now was the object of fawning media praise, but he's a key figure in the emergence of the chef as restaurateur uh, and artistic, creative, and attractive figure. I guess I'd say, in conclusion, you can't have it both ways. If food is to become something more on the high end than the preoccupation of just a few elite plutocrats, then it's open to various forms of leadership and mass following celebrity. And one could do worse than the bravado, energy, skill, and advocacy, at least for its time, of serious entertainment that Paul Bocuse represented. Our final panels is Mitchell Davis, Executive Vice President of the James Beard Foundation, a journalist and a scholar, and he has authored or edited several books. One I love is Kitchen Sense. Thank you, and uh, although I didn't realize at the time, I'm gonna bring it all home. Uh, I actually had the fortune of interviewing Paul Bocuse. Paul Bocuse was the first person I ever interviewed as a professional food writer in his hotel room in Washington, D.C., in French, which is a language I learned, but would not say um, the first language. And the first question out of my mouth was, what is the legacy of you and Nouvelle Cuisine? I was a new reporter, so it was a stupid <laughs> question. But I could form the words grammatically correctly. 
Uh, and to underscore what we've heard uh, already, uh, he said to me without a beat, because he said all these things to many, many times to many people in the same ways, uh, putting my name on the door. Uh, and I think that speaks to a, a few of the things that we've heard here, the chef a restaurateur um, and the implications of that that I want to talk a little bit about uh, in a, some more detail because I do think that's a tremendous legacy and it's not just about the ability to um, create, to change, to, to um, develop some notion of chef as artiste, but there are also some very practical considerations as the owner of a business intended to make profit that you must do uh, that are not always consistent with the, uh, uh, the chef as artist with a patron, let's say. And then I also want to talk about the thing, the question about celebrity, because I, 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 I agree with what, what's been said that, that, that Bocuse is probably most um, authentic um, legacy is the notion of the celebrity chef, the literal putting of the name on the door. That's a radical moment in any um, creative act, let's say. Um, and then I want to, but I want to start with a, 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 a tiny um, understanding that I, I'm someone who believes that when you ask someone what is American cuisine or what is Italian cuisine, that that's, it's a nonsensical question because there is only French cuisine um, in the category of cuisine, which they defined, which they defined by writing things down, by finding innate logics to relationships of sauces, by, by I mean, it, it's no surprise that the French wrote the encyclopedias in 1535. They like to codify the world. It all fits in some order. We can research it, we can flip through, we can index it, we can do all these sorts of things, and they did that with food. And the history of French cuisine, um, as, as Ray mentioned, is about rebelling against this codification of food. Um, so Escoffier pared things down and changed the life of chefs because that crazy carême was overdoing everything. Um, and after Escoffier, uh, and somewhere comes Fernand Point, who decides, oh, what do we need all of this for? You know, I I'm going to pare this down. And then Bocuse pairs it down. And the current, I, I just came back from dinner at Ducasse, and I'll tell you about that later. But he's changing it all again and paring it down. And the, sh the waiters are apologizing for what they're about to bring you as a guest because clearly the French must not want it right now because they're, they're a little bit ashamed, but they're excited because something's happening there. And so this whole idea that there is a codified set of rules that is food and that the next generation or an artist reacts against, I think really only happens in France and probably Japan, let's say, uh, because that's how they see the world as these sort of ordered, neat um, um, systems of things that you can react against. So all of that said, this idea that a legacy um, of Paul Bocuse is, is about owning the restaurant, I think I'm gonna, I'll, add an, I'll add another little story, which is that um, one of the first books, or second book I wrote actually, was called Foie Gras, A Passion, which I co-authored with Michael Gnor, who as um, one of the couple of people who brought sort of or commercialized foie gras in America. And it was at the time that Daniel Ballou was leaving Le Cirque and opening his own restaurant. And Michael bet me that the next order he got from Danielle, once he had his own restaurant, wasn't going to be for grade A foie gras, it was gonna be for grade B. Because when you're paying the bills, you really can only afford grade B. But when someone else is paying the bills, you get the best you can. And so th that's, I tell you that story to illustrate this, some of the impact of putting your name on the door of owning a restaurant, that it really makes you have to make different decisions about how you're gonna run the business. Some of those decisions are what you can afford to do, what, Yes, it's true that we've casualized restaurants today and taken away tablecloths, but I remember actually when Danielle, at the original Danielle, re switched from linen to cotton tablecloths, so he still had a tablecloth, he saved $90,000 a year in expenses, in linen expenses, at the original Danielle, which was a tiny little restaurant, and is now Cafe Ballou. So, so all of these pressures and things that you have to do when you're the owner are very real. At the Beard Foundation right now, we're actually um, cultivating a community. Uh, we're addressing the question of the inequality of women in restaurants in a number of ways, but one that we're doubling down on is this question of ownership, that mm -hmm. actually until women are owning restaurants, um, when they can make the decisions about the culture of the kitchen and the hiring practice and all those sorts of things, um, not much has changed. As an owner, you have to make decisions. They're not always decisions you want to make. Um, they, you, you can find ways to categorize them, to rationalize them, to gastronomize them. Make a word up, why not? Um, 
I'll own it. Um, we can, um, so, so I just think it's interesting to think about how all of these things happen and the stories get told in different ways but the realities sometimes are quite different and they do have an impact. And that's not to say that, that um, less ornate, well it is to say less ornate is also a less labor cost. So you're gonna flute your mushrooms, you're going to uh, tourner your carrots, you're gonna do all these sorts of things for classic cuisine when you own and are paying the bills and are paying the chefs, although we could argue that many of those people in those kitchens weren't paid at that time, um, so things have changed. But today they are and today cuisine is more minimal more pared down, more whatever. There are other forces. I'm not, I don't mean to say everything's an economic decision. I don't believe that at all. But that there are other forces that, that lead to sort of changes in creative products, I think, that are interesting consider when, to consider when talking about food. Um, that, that other notion of celebrity is how do you make a business work? And, and Boku's famously expanded to Japan, and thank God for Japan, because Japan kept all of the restaurants in France open for an entire generation, and thank God today for China, because now the Chinese are keeping all of those restaurants open. And as I said, I just came back from Paris last week, and it was a few Americans and the Chinese in the restaurants. And, and so, and, and that's, a, that's a reality of, of, of eating at a certain level, of who has money when, and, and how things move through different places. And I, I think it's, Yes, it's, it's, it's in some ways a, a shame that it has come to that, but the model of the restaurant as a business hasn't really succeeded since the revolution and the, I mean, the chefs went into the streets. That, uh, he'll tell me there's a lot of detail about that that's not right. But. I'm not a pedant. Yeah, okay, so, um, well, and I, I know that too, but you know what I'm saying. So, um, so I think it, I just, when I, it, it's, we don't always put all these pieces together when we think about dinner, and I, nor should we necessarily, but I do think when you think about the legacy and the decisions that had to be made, it's, it's really, um, these things just factor in interesting ways that we, don't, we sometimes take for granted or don't, don't see, nor should we necessarily. Um, I, the other story I wanted to tell was of this, my meal at Alain Ducasse uh, to a week ago, about a Friday before Memorial Day weekend. Uh, because as I said earlier, um, they are creating a new cuisine. Actually, you could argue that they're reacting against all of the stuff they're hearing and seeing all around the world. Um, so no longer at Ducasse at the Plaza Atenee is any red meat served, which is radical. Um, just fish and shellfish. I had five kinds of, of legumes. I had a gluten-free, the bread service, which was spectacular, I'll say, both uh, literally and gustatorily, uh, was a gluten-free rice uh, focaccia that came on a device this big that they carved horizontally, um, vertically, I guess, uh, and an amazing butter. And, uh, and the meal was exquisite. And the whole time the service were telling us, you know, we're sorry, do you eat your fish this way? Um, there's not going to be X, Y, Z. They put a little extra caviar on it so that the guests are satisfied. And we were in this dialogue. We weren't unknown, but, but we didn't, we were Americans and we were like, this is fun, this is delicious. I don't, why, are you, why are you apologizing? And they're having a really hard time. And that's a function of, a, of a, again, of, of obviously a lot of different things happening at that moment. One of which, of course, is the celebrity of Ducasse. And if you're coming from around the world, from China, from America, from whenever, you wanted that fancy French meal that we know is more pared down in Nouvelle than it used to be, but, but when it's not there, you kind of don't want him to be innovating. You want to have the experience that you've heard about or read about or remembered from the five years ago that you were there. But also, I think, um, it's this constant dialogue with France about um, the cracks in the hegemony of French cuisine that uh, are still they're still pretty wide fishers, I would say. And, and the French, when you start to talk to chefs or journalists, are trying to figure out what their place is. I mean, when they talk to the outside world, internally, they still don't think you can eat anywhere else in the world well. And there's some truth to that. Um, but what has happened is, in the expansion of um, the accessibility, and I mean that not necessarily economically, because it still costs a fortune to eat in these restaurants, but, but the accessibility of other people around the world, the global community, the social networks of people who can afford to eat in these restaurants, um, is that the, the role that eating in these restaurants plays is very different. We're consuming different things than we used to. I joke um, sometimes that when I first, at, at that time actually, when I was interviewing Bocuse back in 1992, uh, he was in DC for a thing, you know, the kids put on suits and ties and we pretended we were adults to go into restaurants. And now all the adults put on t-shirts and sneakers and they come downtown and pretend they're kids. <laughs> and that is not a small, I mean, it's funny, it's true, and it's not a small thing in some ways because, because there's this, um, there's a participation in food in some ways that has changed 
um, those structures that French cuisine is, is kind of built on that has left them, I would say, in my sort of restaurant critic hat, scrambling to find a resonance for this moment in time that isn't weighed down by those strong um, sort of structures that they built in the first place that made them so strong for so long. So it's not just that when you go to eat in France today, you're trying to find, their chefs are trying to find things that taste good in the context of French cuisine. I think they're having an existential, which is a good place to have it in France, uh, crisis about what what role they play, what what fat, what food, what where French food sits in this international space. They don't have a crisis about where French food fits in life in France. That that's pretty obvious, and it's you you experience it everything you eat. But in this global stage where there are so many other players, where the news media, news cycle turns every twenty you know, every, every twenty tweets or whatever it is, all there I, I think that they're trying to find a place to have a voice that that is consistent with where they have been, but is no longer in their control. And I think it's an interesting time. I think it's ironic that at this moment in time, French food around the world is the hottest food again that it's ever been. But in France, they're trying to figure it all out. They don't know what to do <coughs> with that. But when I go to Le Cuckoo or you go to La Mercerie, there are these fantasy film sets of French restaurants that don't exist in France, really, or, or, or maybe never did, just like Balthazar was 20 years ago, a sort of uh, a, a theme restaurant is really all you could call it, really well done and well executed. And yet this fantasy, this, this, this eminence of French cuisine hasn't changed necessarily in the minds of others. But in France, this existential anxiety, I think, um, this gastronomic uh, questioning is pretty, pretty strong. Uh, and you taste it, um, and you, you're rooting for them, at least I'm rooting for them. Um, and I think the world is, the respect that chefs have, that diners have for that role they had, you're rooting for them. But right now, it's, 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 it, it's really unclear where it's going like, to come down. That's what I can say. I have a thousand questions, but we'll limit it to a few here. The first one is what Anne raised to begin with, and others uh, mentioned. In 1975, uh, Bocuse is quoted as saying, women lack the instincts for great cooking. Women who become chefs are limited in their accomplishments. They have one or two dishes they accomplish very well, but they're not great innovators. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's become a badge of honor to be a, a James Beard Award-winning chef these days, so I may, to have that letter from Bocuse where they refused you entry into his kitchen, anyway. <laughs> and there are many of them out there. I mean, I, I don't know... I, I, I don't know necessarily what to add to this, because it's clear... And those are the type of questions that we have a lot right now, in terms of does someone's statement or position um, affect the present. Meaning, I mean, this is a 1975 statement, you said? Yes, but everybody says that was his views. For oh, that was 100% his views. And I mean, I don't think, um, did I mean, yeah, his first executive chef was 2000, a female executive chef was 2013. So I don't think that necessarily changed. I would hope that along the way, um, he did, I don't know, ponder that a little bit. And even if he did not admit it publicly, maybe thought that he had been wrong there. Um, but I, yeah, I don't necessarily know what comment to add to that other than clearly he was wrong. You know, this is not a statement that I would support. This is not a, a statement that I even want to say, well, you know, it was 1975 and that's what French men said. And yes, it was 1975, that's what French men said. That doesn't make it okay now. So I don't necessarily is know. Is it still true today? Well, this was never freaking true. I mean, I'm sorry, but this was never true. This was. He <laughs> was asking, would it still be an acceptable? Would it still be an acceptable statement? Not acceptable, but would it be an underlying assumption of people in France? So, um, a lot of the chefs that I work with in French, and it's really interesting uh, what you're saying in terms of. I think the generation of Ducasse and Trois Gros and, and Robuchon, those are the people who are really struggling with an identity crisis because for so long they have been so identified with the classic food and the classic business model and the classic luxury. Um, and it's a little bit, a, a note I jotted down as Mitchell was concluding, um, it's very much what's happening with big corporations versus innovators in the food system here. 
here. So companies like Campbell's or Unilever or um, G uh, General Mills really struggling with, they can't innovate because they're so big. And so Bocuse uh, and that model of corporations of restaurants in a way makes it that it's really, really hard to innovate. And when you have three Michelin stars and you've had them for 20 or 30 years, it's not rewarding innovation versus 50 best, which rewards innovation and changes every year. And it's not necessarily any more logical, um, but it is much more modular. So the, the 30 year old, 35 year old French chefs that I deal with in Paris, they are very confident. They have a very strong sense of identity. Um, and they are the first ones to tell me if I invite them to a conference, which woman chef are you bringing? Um, and to say, this friend of mine, my girlfriend, my wife, my partner, they are the first ones to have um, women in their kitchen, kitchens that are much more diverse. I mean, the, the, uh, l'Institut Paul Bocuse has more women than men enrolled in school. That's a good thing. L'Ecole Ferrandi, la même, le, the same thing. Um, and so that generation is much more, I mean, this isn't to say there's no sexism in you know, young French kitchens. I'm really not trying to say that. But I think that in this current climate, this statement would not be made, would not be acceptable. Um, and I really firmly believe that the generation of chef that has come after Bocuse is not wanting to replicate the same kind of model. I wanted to get the other panelists to make a comment too. <laughs> You got me started. Uh, silence I was, on the other end. I was just going to add one small thing, which is that those young chefs in Paris are also reacting against that system. They're not just yeah. reacting against the food. It, they left, uh, they sort of stepped aside and did the radical thing of, you know, giving up the star system to do something yeah. different. And you had to, you have yeah. to, to do it. Yeah. It's a curious thing, though, that the world that Bocuse rose from in Lyon was probably the only serious food center in the world that had a network of revered women chefs. Yeah, right? <laughs> right, right. Mère Brasier, right. and the place where you'd walk in through the kitchen, uh, uh, Lea, and uh, I mean, there yeah, were a half a dozen of them. If, uh, and they, I think his particular snobbery there, you know, of course it was very traditional and, and you know, grossly sexist, but on the other hand, even at the level of those women, he could look at them and say, well, you know, they have this kind of appeal and it's, it's very, very amusing, but it's not, it's not at the highest level. I mean, he could say yeah. that to himself. Right. I'm yeah. not s trying to uh, make a distinction right. here. But it's a, a curious thing. And when um, w all of the things that even what you're saying ab about uh, this vegetable cuisine that, that mm -hmm. you encountered, um, think about Arpege, mm -hmm. which, which was really that restaurant mm -hmm. and at, at the very highest level. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it prospered, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, it seemed to be doing well when I was there. Um, I mean, all of these things come back in a right. circle. And the, the, I mean, what you're talking about, of course, didn't exist, but, but the, um, in terms of, I mean, uh, of, of what's on the plate and how, how when you talk about Bocuse as, an inter as a global chef, well, you have to also think about Karem, who cooked for the czars mm -hmm. and, and all over Europe. Uh, but the, I mean, what was possible internationally then, he did it. But the, the, what changed was that in every country, a, the, the traditional cuisine went through um, a kind of new, nouvelle cuisine process. Uh, you saw, you, you, I saw it in, in Spain, in, uh, except Italy. The one, <laughs> the one place that resisted any kind of, of uh, a, 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 there are exceptions now. But the, uh, in Spain, in Brazil, uh, ev everywhere, they looked at the food that they had been, in the Philippines, I, uh, you, they would look at the, this distinct cuisine that everyone, everyone ate and turn it inside out in using a process. It was almost, you know, that if you had, what, what, the peop, what Adria did every year was to go to France in the beginning uh, he, uh, to see what, what the new things were. And then, and by then, there were lots of new things. So, I, anyhow, that's... Uh, any comments on gender issue, Paul? No, I think we can move on. Uh, no, well, I, just that it's still pretty bad out there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, uh, in part, I don't think you can blame a person or his uh, one no. belief, but 
but as an organization, we, it's the Me Too movement was only shocking to people outside restaurants, not inside right. restaurants. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's tough. But even in in a, a place run run by a uh, powerful woman. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I uh, so I don't know yeah. what what you okay. draw from that. My my next question is on his legacy. Uh, Andre Soltner made the following quote. He took chefs out of the servant category. He made an honorable, glamorous, respected mm -hmm. profession, and so attracted a new generation of bright, dedicated, educated young men and women. <laughs> what is his legacy? I, I don't think that's it exactly. I mean, I wouldn't uh, want to dispute it with someone as eminent as Saltner, but there were, um, always chefs who were considered artists and chefs who were considered servants or chefs who were considered uh, 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 highly honorable. Um, right, Taillevant in the uh, 14th century received a knighthood. Uh, it's true that his coat of arms is three sauce pots, but he was pleased with it because he's, you know, his tomb survives and, and he is clad as a knight with a sword and little dogs at his feet and uh, his coat of arms. So there have been celebrity chefs for a very long time. And the, the, most chefs might be said to be servants, but so are most people who you know, paint uh, uh, in, uh, for much of history. Uh, the rise of a substantial class or the default setting being, what kinds of things have you invented or what, what is your uh, a particular form of expression as a chef. That certainly is new, and he bears a lot of uh, uh, credit for that. Um, I, I think it's interesting. Ray said that Karem was a global chef, and I agree, but Bocuse was a global brand, and I think that that is something very different, and it brings different pressures and different um, commitments, and so I think there's something in that, and uh, there, that was the time, perhaps, of some other broadly spreading global brands, luxury brands in particular. Um, I think what's interesting to me is I do think part of his legacy is the Bocuse d'Or, mm -hmm. uh, but what I find fascinating about that is last year the United States won the Bocuse d'Or, which is a, a historic mo moment of incredible scale everywhere but in America. Um, you know, the, the winning of the Bocuse d'Or was as, as important in Denmark as René Redzepi being the number one restaurant in the world to change the nature, the, the, the cultural, the, hi, the hierarchical position of Denmark in the world of cuisine. And, and, and here, I don't know that I could walk into a restaurant anywhere and find a chef who knew who the chef was or that it had happened. And yet it's, so, so there's something there that I, I, I don't even know what, I'm, what my point is exactly, but, but it's, it, it speaks to this this uniqueness of a, or this changing guard of a sort of approach to food or culture in a way, this breaking down of the brands, the big things, the, 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 the small and independent is better in some way, that the moment that we're in. It's, it's remarkable to me that that didn't become news. But the, the Bocuse d'Or, I mean, he, Bocuse himself was a, a mayor ouvrier de France. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole network of typical French you know, contests to create hierarchies. And the, the, the mayor ouvrier de France was not only for chefs, but for plumbers and electricians. Mm -hmm. And they, they would set problems. And the, so that contest that he won, I mean, in his world uh, in, in, I think, 1961, was, um, was an amazing thing. And, and everyone knew about it. I mean, you, uh, Soldner was a mayor of Rio de France, mm -hmm. and he went back to France to get the, the, the title. Yes. So mm -hmm. the, the, within the profession, those things have, have mattered. In France? In yes. the, within French, yeah. among the, but, right. but the Bocuse d'Or is an international um, but, contest. But you're saying that nobody knows about it outside no. France. Isn't that what you said? Outside saying? of, in America. No, they know, a lot of people know about it outside of America. I see. Nobody knows it in America or gives it any mind. What, and what, what would the difference be? I mean, why, why would everyone else care about it? And, and well, because I think that's, that's sort of what we've given the world of food in some way, is that disregard for all those things, that, that, which I think you see spreading everywhere you go, in restaurants in Milan and Tokyo, and, and I was just in um, uh, 
where, where was I? I don't even know where I was. Oh, I guess it was Paris, where you suddenly you're sitting in Brooklyn. I mean, what you described as Michel Gerard was Brooklyn in a garage, sitting out back, you know, with a, put on a ta some tattoos and a and a plaid thing, and that that sort of that's become the thing we export here. Is that that? I mean, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of intent that goes into that. But when I say disregard, you know, a, sort of a rebelliousness of food in a way, which is ironic because the French rebelled clearly about against all of the things that that changed their food. But but I think that there's something there that 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 makes the tremendous accomplishment of doing something you dedicate your life to, you win, be meaningless among the craftsmen of that profession here. Well, I think. Um, so my research is actually on expertise rather than gender. I'm not a one-trick pony, but obviously very passionate about that. So I'll go on that. The, the US does not value profession and expertise the same way that Europe does. It, val it values entertainment and showmanship a lot more. Um, and so the Bocuse d'Or are, there, there's an element of spectacle, obviously, but it's not a scripted or you know spectacle like, or reality show style spectacle. Um, so I think that does a lot for the fact that it hasn't become more popular here and that the MOF is not something that's really appreciated or valued here because it's a certificate. And that's not what in this country we think of as accomplishment or as demonstration of skills. So that's, that's where that biggest nuance is for me. And I think that's something that Bocuse really understood. And um, I was reading that he was the first one to to, um, he talked with a, a chef's jacket manufacturer to put the French flag on the jacket to show that you had an MOF because there was no outward display mm. of that before he, he created this. So he really understood this sense of branding and this sense of marketing. And his biggest skill and biggest legacy is probably in this communication and the fact that he, he he told chefs and he taught chefs and showed them how to market themselves mm -hmm. and how to become these brands and how to say, these are the skills I have. This is the gold, you know, the Bocuse d'Or have won. This is this competition I've won. This is this, this MOF I've earned, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, th these businesses I've created. And that's probably a little bit um, forgotten in his legacy in terms of, um, you know, as, as, uh, probably especially in recent years where he was kind of um, this old man you would parade around and, you know, it's Bocuse, you need to go and kiss the ring um, without necessarily an, a, an appreciation for those things that mm -hmm. he did and, and that he allowed chefs to, to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Mimi Sheraton had this love-hate affair with Paul Bocuse and one of the things that she talked about was his, the branding that he had, the global branding, and several of you have raised that. Um, he did have a frozen food line. He yeah. did have a canned soup line. Uh, he did have some restaurants that I would look at and say are fast food <laughs> establishments. Uh, and so he had a variety of things. What, uh, and one of the comments that I thought was interesting was chefs could escape the kitchen, make a fortune, and live the life of a rock star. Uh, and Mamie Sheraton mentioned that he was never in his restaurants that in fact uh, he uh, was associated with. Comments on his legacy. That's just classism to me. That to me that every chef, every famous chef right now in the world is trying to open a fast food restaurant, yeah. for starters. <laughs> so his legacy lives on. There too. <laughs> Everyone, 11 Madison, go to Made Nice on 28th Street, you'll have the number one restaurant in the world's uh, takeout food in a, you know, and soft serve ice cream. So, and it hasn't tarnished their authenticity or their worth. To me that, I, I mean, I think, as I said earlier, the realities of run, the, 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 rea the business model of a restaurant has not worked since restaurants started. The margins in food don't make any sense because we will not pay what it actually costs. It's so much so that in this country, we don't even pay the service it costs to, to, to deliver it to you. Like it, 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 it's a broken model that persists and only persists because of all these other ways that people can make money at it. Uh, because if you just had a restaurant with 20 seats, which is what everybody wants, you would not exist, or you'd you'd never be anywhere near a metropolitan center, and then no one would really come. So, so to me, uh, th when you, when I hear that, I just think that's just a that's a classist response, and I know that part of what keeps haute cuisine haute is a separation of accessibility and and um, comprehension and the the 
the appreciation that comes with a fine-tuned understanding of the class structures of which something is produced. And, and I, I'll also admit I'm up there. I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't have those things or appreciate those things, but, but I don't think that's an argument about his skill as a chef or his worth in the, or his legacy, really. I think what, what we're not talking about, though, is um, our, the food mm. that, that he actually served, which, mm. which should, you think, be the legacy of a great <laughs> chef. And with Escoffier, there's no question, the guide culinaire is his legacy. Mm. And uh, it, it, for the, all the period after his death, um, which was a period of stagnation in, in French cuisine because of the Depression and World War II, um, it, it was there as, as a monument, as a legacy. But certainly none of Bocuse's books, they're probably not even in print. And uh, if, I mean, I can name dishes I ate there, but I don't think there's, uh, you, if there's anyone else here who wants to talk about his food, I think I would like to hear about it. I mean, I can, <laughs> for example, I will tell uh, the, 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 the truffle soup. <laughs> But right. really, show, See, showmanship, which which is a which is a very good segue into the next step. So we have microphones on either side, uh, and if you could keep your uh, comments uh, brief, we would appreciate it. Do you want to talk? No, we need we need with microphone, in order to be able to hear. Well, I'm surprised that nobody's talked about the soup, uh, which kind of, I mean, I ate there before the soup was on the front page of the New York Times or wherever the, but it was a stunt, that soup. Yeah, it was showmanship. Yeah. And it worked when, when they opened, do we, does everyone know what we're talking about, that soup? Ah, the truffle soup with puff pastry. I don't know, I actually don't remember what the broth was. Um, sure, but it was truffles, know. some broth, and puff pastry. And you, you, you kind it. of penetrated the puff pastry and got this fabulous truffle aroma. Um, maybe the soup, actually. It was, was a consomme, know, I think. Truffle yeah. ends yeah. or something. Consomme and foie, slab of foie, foie gras. Yeah. But it, the way you describe it, it's like, a, it's like a, Adria made it also. But this was 1975. Yeah, no, I know, I know. That's what's amazing. Yeah. You know, that, that um, sort of invoking the senses. Over here. It was the late 70s. Les Dames de Scoffier was founded in 76. And as the founder, I felt that I had to sample French food. And for Mary Lyons, who was the public relations person for French food, I got the list. I could have made it myself. They were all the top Michelin restaurants. So I did go to Bakus. I was appalled by, I knew there'd be a, a neon sign, <laughs> but it's a foot high. <laughs> it was incredible. And the ambiance was, ugh. Interestingly enough, I also went to the Trogras, and that was wonderful. But one of the, the f I didn't like the food. He was there. As the food reporter of the Daily News, I wasn't interested in interviewing him. I didn't like the gentleman. But I think that we should point out that in this Me Too world, he was here in New York. He came to Brooklyn Technical College to apologize for what he had said about women chefs. And I have his picture. He left his picture there. They just found it at 3 p.m. today <laughs> and sent it to me. So I think we have to think of two things. I agree with you wholeheartedly on the public relations aspect of him, and I salute him for that and what he has done for chefs, he's and she chefs. But also, I think it's interesting that he was here in New York at Brooklyn Tech, apologized, and so forth. When was when? What year? Can I just say one thing? What uh, Mit what Mitchell, go ahead. What, yes. what year was he here? Unfortunately, 
Florence Fabric Hans article does not have the date on it, but I have the article. Okay. I just wanted to say one thing we didn't mention about his legacy, and it, you reminded me of it, is he believed in America and in American chefs and food in a way, like promoted, supported, sent his son to the CIA, which was a f famous moment. And in some ways, that, at that time, that was an incredibly legitimizing thing for uh, American chefs and, and restaurants. Um, because n many of his compatriots would not have um, done as much. So I don't know what he thought inside, but his actions were very uh, generous to the United States and the potential here for great food. Mm -hmm. 100%. Uh, e even at Disneyland. Yeah. 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 Comments? Questions? This isn't like a yeah. normal, usually there's plenty of. I, <clears throat> I met him in 1992. I was taken to the uh, market at the, on the, along the, the Quay Saint-Vincent, where he shopped down by the Seine River, by another chef who was a close friend of mine now. Uh, and he, when, he, when he found out that I was a chef at the time, he said, oh, you should you should just worry about being beautiful and not about co leave the cooking to the men. <laughs> and that was why I said I wondered when was that he made that apology mm. at the mm -hmm. <laughs> at Brooklyn Tech because he wasn't about that at all. <laughs> I mean that was uh, it, the, the chef who took me there trained with him. But the thing that one of the things that I find really interesting about his demeaning of women was he apprenticed with Mayor Brazier? Yeah, that was very yeah. mm -hmm. That's, that's he right. Was brought, he was brought well, into Maybe the it didn't go so well. <laughs> what? Maybe it didn't go so well, I don't know. Well, he was, <laughs> she, she was, she was yeah. his teacher. I mean, no, I think that was she Ray's point, her. and that, that's what is still very common of a lot of French chefs and a lot of chefs, period. There's this huge distinction between what their mothers did, right? I mean. If I read one more bio or press release about a chef that talks about them learning to cook with their mother or grandmother, I mean, that's a standard statement. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily, it's it completely different mother. skill. No, 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 but in no. terms she, of the yeah, style of understand. food. She had six, she had th six Michelin yeah. stars. Yeah, yeah stars but. each of two restaurants. Ray's point was that it was a different style of cuisine that wasn't as elevated as his, and I think that's, that's very true of what a lot of chefs at the level of Bocuse but it was think. That, but that was not her, her style of cuisine. No. She, yeah. well, Another she was not a, just, she was not a, a Bouchon chef, not yeah. at all. Mm. Well, but. but Really, what I meant was that uh, his he, how how did he form his attitudes about women in the kitchen, it, uh, w serious professional women in the kitchen? There weren't so many, obviously. And but in Lyon, if he had if he had been in Paris, there would have been essentially none. And but in Lyon, he trained with with a great one, and they were all over the place. They were revered, and so the only. You know, unless he's making it up, you, the, the only uh, realistic evidence he would have had uh, of the, the difference between himself and women in the kitchen would have been in Lyon, and they would have been very successful and admired. But I think that, for, that what he, what the, oh, the best thing you could say is that he thought of them as representatives of a kind of folkloric, uh, not exactly first tier, uh, it wasn't like Poin, let me tell you, you know, I mean, the, that place was in, I mean, I, Poin was dead when I went there, but it was 1963, and the thing was running, you know, at full tilt. It, uh, it, it was the most elegant and, and seductive kind of place. It wasn't like um, uh, th those somewhat, um, you know, less uh, top, top drawer restaurants that you could find in France, I mean, La Serre, uh, places of that, of that order, they, they were different. They, they were uh, in, in, a, in a world of, tr of a different tradition, and, and it was female. And so that, I think it was a, a small snobbery on his part, and, and, and really ungenerous and foolish, but I think that's what he, it's the only thing he could have been talking about, unless he had an idea, other people would tell you 
Um, oh, they can't work in a serious kitchen because the pots are too heavy. You know, that kind of thing. You heard that. So um, I don't know. Uh, but I think it's, in a way, he also could have hated women. Okay. Who knows? <laughs> he was having an affair with, his, you know, we, how are we going to know what he, what, what formed? Yeah. Well, I, I, mean, I, I, I don't I, think I, he was interested in, in that woman's ab abilities in the cook. kitchen. Yeah. I mean, the, the, no, the, I agree with the you. The restaurant you're, that he took you to I think was very nice. think your evaluation is very generous, but he also could have been a jerk. <laughs> you know, yeah, like when it comes yeah, to women, yeah. there, we all have many lives. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Hi, um, I am a student at the Culinary Institute myself, and there is a lot of sh questions coming out with, as we all know, like um, the Culinary Institute has a restaurant um, on the honor of Paul Bocuse. And a lot of the questions right now from students, the conversations that we had lies in, he just, you know, what's the branding of Paul Bocuse himself? And for me, I have a question in regards of, does the simplification of like the cuisine of what he brought as a legacy has a lot of to do with the uh, modernization of technologies as well as the demand of how people right now, they just want something so quick, not something that we just, you know, just sit down and have something so elaborate. <laughs> Thank you. I actually think, Personally, I think of that notion of simplicity from production side more a legacy of Escoffier than of Bocuse. That Escoffier was committed, he may have been a, and was by all accounts a great chef who made delicious things, but he was committed to improving the life of the chef, at least in his memoirs and some of his papers. And I remember a very interesting conversation with Jacques Pepin who grew up in, in a very traditional, learned to cook in a very traditional kitchen in Paris with giant pulleys and mortars and pestles and all sorts of things in a big hotel. And he said he believed that Escoffier would have been the first to embrace the Cuisinart, which may, required no sweating and bullying <laughs> and whatever and all these sorts of things. Like there was a tr there were different again, sort of it's been my theme today. There are different pressures that take you to places that that find their way into things. And so, well, yeah. Jacques, Jacques began as an apprentice in Bourg-en-Bresse at 15, I think, and uh, he told me that in in that kitchen, if you talk about hierarchy, when they were done and everything was put away. Then the chef had gone home. They would take a pastry. They, they they would create a pastry decoration for the stove. They would decorate it like a large oh cake, my God, wow. <laughs> and, and and then to greet the chef in the morning. <laughs> well, I want to uh, thank our panelists for a wonderful.